The Palace Thief by Ethan Cannon. I tell this story not for my own honor, for there is little of that here, and not as a warning, for a man of my calling learns quickly that all warnings are in vain. Nor do I tell it in apology for St. Benedict's School, for St. Benedict's School needs no apologies. I tell it only to record certain foretellable incidents in the life of a well-known man, in the event that the brief candle of his days may sometime come under the scrutiny of another student of history. That is all. This is a story without surprises. There are those, in fact, who say, I should have known what would happen between St. Benedict's and me, and I suppose that they are right, but I loved that school. I gave service there to the minds of three generations of boys and always left upon them, if I was successful, the delicate imprint of their culture. I battled their indolence with discipline, their boorishness with philosophy, and the arrogance of their stations with the history of great men before them. I taught the sons of 19 senators. I taught a boy who, if not for the vengeful recriminations of the tabloids, would today have been the President of the United States. That school was my life. That is why, I suppose, I accepted the invitation sent to me by Mr. Sedgwick Bell at the end of last year, although I should have known better. I suppose I should have recalled what kind of boy he had been at St. Benedict's 41 years before, instead of posting my response so promptly in the mail and beginning that evening to prepare my test. He, of course, was the son of Senator Sedgwick Haram Bell, the West Virginian demagogue who kept horses at his residence in Washington, D.C., and had swung several southern states for Wendell Wickey. The younger Sedgwick was a dull boy. I first met him when I had been teaching history at St. Benedict's for only five years. In the autumn after his father had been delivered to office on the shoulders of southern patricians frightened by the unization of steel and mine workers, Cedric appeared in my classroom in November of 1945 in a short pants suit. It was midway through the fall term, that term in which I brought the boys forth from the philosophical idealism of the Greeks into the realm of commerce, military might, and the law, which had given Julius Caesar his prerogative from Macedonia to Zavel. My students, of course, were agitated. It is a sad distinction of that age group, the exuberance with which the boys abandoned the moral endeavor of Plato and embraced the powerful, pragmatic hand of Augustus. The more sensitive ones had grown silent, and for several weeks our class discussions had been dominated by the martial instincts of the coarser boys. Of course I was sorry for this, but I was well aware of the import of what I taught at St. Benedict's. Our headmaster, Mr. Woodbridge, made us continually aware of the role our students would eventually play in the affairs of our country. My classroom was in fact a tribute to the lofty ideals of man, which I hoped would inspire my boys, and at the same time to the fleeting nature of human accomplishment, which I hoped would temper their ambition with humility. It was a dual tactic with which Mr. Woodbridge heartily agreed. Above the door frame hung a tablet made as a term project by Henry L. Stimson when he was a boy here, that I hoped would teach my students of the irony that history bestows upon ambition. In clay relief, it said, I am Shukruk Nuhente, king of Asham and Susa, sovereign of the land of Elam. By the command of Inshu Shinak, I destroyed Sippar, took the steel of Naram Sin, and brought it back to Elam, where, I erected it as an offering to my god in Shushanak. Shukruk Nuhunte, 1158 BC. I always noted this tablet to the boys on their first day in my classroom, partly to inform them of their predecessors at St. Benedict's and partly to remind them of the great ambition and conquest that had been utterly forgotten centuries before they were born. Afterward, I had one of them recite from the wall where it hung above my desk, Shelley's Ozamandes. It is critical for any man of import to understand his own insignificance before the sands of time, and this is what my classroom always showed my boys. As young Cedric Bell stood in the doorway of that classroom his first day at St. Benedict's, however, it was apparent that such efforts would be lost on him. 
I could see that he was not only a dullard, but a rustabout. The boys happened to be wearing togas they had made from sheets and safety pins the day before, spreading their knees like magistrates in wooden desk chairs, and I was taking them through the recitation of the emperors when Mr. Woodbridge entered alongside the stout, red-faced Sedgwick and introduced him to the class. I had taught for several years already, as I have said, and I knew the look of frightened, desperate bravura on a new boy's face. Sedgwick Bell did not wear this look. Rather, he wore one of disdain. The boys, fifteen in all, were instantly intimidated into sensing the foolishness of their improvised cloaks, and one of them, Fred Masudi, the leader of the dullards, though far from a dullard himself, said, to mild laughter, "'Where's your toga, kid?' Cedric Bell answered, "'Your mother must be wearing your pants today.' It took me a moment to regain the attention of the class, and when Cedric was seated, I had him go to the board and copy out the emperors. Of course, he did not know the names of any of them, and my boys had to call them out, repeatedly correcting his spelling as he wrote out in a sloppy hand. Augustus, Tiberius, Calagula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho. All the while lifting and resettling the legs of his short pants in mockery of what his new classmates were wearing. Young man, I said, this is a serious class and I expect that you will take it seriously. If this is such a serious class, then why are they all wearing dresses? He responded again to laughter, although by now Fred Masudi had loosened the rope belt at his waist, and the boys around him were shifting uncomfortably in their togas. From that first day, Cedric Bell was a bore and a bully, a damper to the illumination of the eager minds of my boys, and a purveyor of the mean-spirited humor that is like a kerosene in a school such as ours. What I asked of my boys that semester was simple, that they learn the facts I presented to them in an outline of ancient Roman history, which I had whittled through my years of teaching to exactly four closely typed pages, yet Cedric Bell was unwilling to do so. He was a poor student and on his first exam could not even tell me who it was that Mark Anthony and Octavian had rooted at Philippa, nor who Octavian later became, although an average wood beetle on the floor of my classroom could have done so with ease. Furthermore, as soon as he arrived, he began a stream of Caspers using spitballs, wads of gum, and thumbtacks. Of course, it was common for a new boy to engage his comrades thusly, but Cedric Bell then began to add the dangerous element of natural leadership, which was based on the physical strength of his features, to his otherwise puerile antics. He organized the boys. At exactly 15 minutes to the hour, they would all drop their pencils at once or cough, or slap close their books so that writing at the blackboard, my hands would jump in the air. At a boys' school, of course, punishment is a cultivated art. Whenever one of these antics occurred, I simply made a point of calling on Cedric Bell to answer a question. General laughter usually followed his stabs at answers, and although Cedric himself usually laughed along with everyone else, it did not require a great deal of insight to know that the tactic would work. The organized events began to occur less frequently. In retrospect, however, perhaps my strategy was a mistake, for to convince a boy of his own stupidity is to shoot a poisonous arrow indeed. Perhaps Cedric Bell's life would have turned out more nobly if I had understood his motivations right away and treated him differently at the start. But such are the pointless speculations of a teacher. What was irrefutably true was that he was performing poorly on his quizzes, even if his behavior had improved somewhat, and therefore I called him to my office. In those days, I lived in small quarters off the rear of the main hall, in what had been a slave's room, when the grounds of St. Benedict's had been the estate of the philanthropist and horse breeder, Cyrus Beck. Having been at school as long as I had, I no longer lived in the first form dormitory that stood behind my room, but supervised it, so that I saw most of the boys only in matters of urgency. They came sheepishly before me. With my bed folded into the wall, the room became my office, and shortly after supper one day that winter of his first form year, Cedric Bell knocked and entered. Immediately he began to inspect the premises, casting his eyes which had the patrician set of his father's, from the desk to the shelves to the bed folded into the wall. Sit down, boy. 
You're not married, are you, sir? No, Sedgwick, I'm not. However, we are here to talk about you. That's why you like putting us in togas, right? Frankly, I had never encountered a boy like him before who, at the age of 13, would affront his schoolmaster without other boys in audience. He gazed at me flatly, his chin in his hand. Young man, I said, sensing his motivations with sudden clarity. We are concerned about your performance here, and I have made an appointment to see your father. In fact, I had made no appointment with Senator Bell, but at that moment I understood that I would have to. What would you like me to tell the senator? I said. His gaze faltered. I'm going to try harder, sir, from now on. Good, Cedric, good. Indeed, that week the boys reenacted the pivotal scenes from Julius Caesar, and Cedric read his lines quite passably and contributed little that I could see to the occasional fits of giggles that circulated among the slower boys. The next week, I gave a quiz on the triumvirate of Crassus, Pompey, and Caesar, and he passed for the first time yet with a C+. Plus. Nonetheless, I had told him that I was going to speak with his father, and this is what I determined to do. At the time, Senator Sedgwick Haram Bell was appearing regularly in the newspapers and on the radio in his stand against Truman's plan for national health insurance, and I was loath to call upon such a well-known man concerning the behavior of his son. On the radio, his voice was a tobacco drawl that had won him populous appeal throughout West Virginia, although his policies alone would certainly not have done so. I was at the time in my late 20s, and although I was armed with scruples and education, my hands trembled as I dialed his office. To my surprise, I was put through, and the senator, in the drawl I recognized instantly, agreed to meet me one afternoon the following week. The man already enjoyed national stature, of course, and although any other father would no doubt have made the journey to St. Benedict's himself, I admit that the prospect of seeing the man in his own office intrigued me. Thus, I journeyed to the capital. St. Benedict's lies in the bucolic equine expanse of rural Virginia, nearer in spirit to the Carolinas than to Maryland, although the drive to Washington requires little more than an hour. The bus followed the misty, serpentine course of the Pasmic, then entered the marshlands that are now the false brick suburbs of Washington, and at last left me downtown in the capital, where I proceeded the rest of the way on foot. I arrived at the Senate office building as the sun moved low against the bare limb cherries among the grounds. I was frightened but determined, and I reminded myself that Sedgwick Heron Bell was a senator, but also a father, and I was here on business that concerned his son. The office was as grand as a duke's. I had not waited long in the anteroom when the man himself appeared feisty as a game hen, bursting through his side door and clapping me on the shoulder as he urged me before him into his office. Of course, I was a novice then in the world of politics and had not yet realized that such men are, above all, likable. He put me in a leather seat, offered me a cigar, which I refused, and then with the real or contrived wonder, perhaps he did something like this with all his visitors, he proceeded to show me an antique sidearm that had been sent to him that morning by a constituent and that had once belonged, he said, to the coachman of Robert E. Lee. You're a history buff, he said, right? Yes, sir. Then take it, it's yours. No, sir, I couldn't take the damn thing. All right, I will. Now, what brings you to this dreary little office? Your son, sir. What the devil has he done now? Very little, sir. We're concerned that he isn't learning the material. What material is that? We're studying the Romans now, sir. We've left the Republic and entered the Empire. Ah, he said. Be careful with that. By the way, it still fires. Your son seems not to be paying attention, sir. He again offered me the box of cigars across the table and then bit off the end of his own. Tell me, he said, puffing the thing until it flamed suddenly. What's the good of what you're teaching them, boys? This was a question for which I was well prepared, fortunately, having recently written a short piece in the St. Benedict's Crier, answering the same challenge put forth there by an anonymous boy. When they read the reign of Augustus Caesar, I said without hesitation, when they learn that his rule was bolstered by commerce, a postal system, and the arts, by the reformation of the Senate, and by the writing of an inequitable system of taxation, 
When they see the effect of scientific progress through the census and the enviable network of Roman roads, how these advancements led mankind away from the brutish rivalries of potentates into the two centuries of Pax Romana, then they understand the importance of character and high ideals. He puffed at his cigar. Now that's a horse who can talk, he said. And you're telling me my son Sedgwick has his head in the clouds? It's my job, sir, to mold your son's character. He thought for a moment, idly fingering a match. Then his look turned stern. I'm sorry, young man, he said slowly. But you will not mold him. I will mold him. You will merely teach him. That was the end of my interview, and I was politely shown the door. I was bewildered, naturally, and found myself in the elevator before I could even take account of what had happened. Senator Bell was quite likable, as I have noted, but he had, without doubt, cut me, and as I made my way back to the bus station, the gun stowed deep in my briefcase, I considered what it must have been like to have been raised under such a tyrant. My heart warmed somewhat toward young Sedgwick. Back at St. Benedict's, furthermore, I saw that my words had evidently had some effect on the boy, for in the weeks that followed, he continued on his struggling uphill course. He passed two more quizzes, receiving an A- minus on one of them. For his midterm project, he produced an adequate papier-mâché rendering of Hadrian's Gate, and in class he was less disruptive to the group of do-nothings among whom he sat, if indeed he was not, in fact, attentive. Such, of course, are the honeyed morsels of a teacher's existence. Those students who come under one's own direction, from darkness into the light, and I admit that I might have taken a special interest that term in Sedgwick Bell, if I give him the benefit of the doubt on his quizzes when he straddled two grades, if I began to call on him in class only for those questions I had reason to believe he could answer, then I was merely trying to encourage the nascent curiosity of a boy who, to all appearances, was struggling gamely from beneath the formidable umbra of his father. The fall term was by then drawing to a close and the boys had begun the frenzy of preliminary quizzes for the annual Mr. Julius Caesar competition. Here again, I suppose I was in my own way rooting for Sedgwick. Mr. Julius Caesar is a St. Benedict's tradition held in reverence among the boys, the kind of mythic ritual that is the currency of a school like ours. It is a contest held in two parts. The first is a narrowing maneuver, by means of a dozen written quizzes from which three boys from the first form emerge victorious. The second is a public tournament in which these three take the stage before the assembled student body and answer questions about ancient Rome until one alone emerges triumphant, as had Caesar himself among Crassus and Pompey. Parents and graduates fill out the audience. In front of Mr. Woodbridge's office, a plague attests to the Mr. Julius Caesar's of the previous half century, a list that begins with John F. Dulles in 1901. And although the ritual might seem quaint to those who have not attended St. Benedict's, I can only say that in a school like ours, one cannot overstate the importance of a public joust. That year, I had three obvious contenders. Fred Masudi, who, as I intimated, was a somewhat gifted boy, Martin Blythe, a studious type, and Deepak Mehta, the son of a Bombay mathematician who was dreadfully quiet but clearly my best student. It was Deepak, in fact, who, on his own and entirely separate from the class, had studied the disparate peoples from the Carthaginians to the Egyptians whom the Romans had conquered. By the end of the narrow quizzes, however, a surprising configuration had emerged. Sedgwick Bell had pulled himself to within a few points of third place in my class. This was when I made my first mistake. Although I should certainly have known better, I was impressed enough by his efforts that I broke one of the cardinal rules of teaching. I gave him an A on a quiz on which he had earned only a B, and in doing so, I leapfrogged him over Martin Blythe. On the 15th of March, when the three finalists took their seats on stage in front of the assembled population of the school, Cedric Bell was among them and his father was among the audience. The three boys had donned their togas for the event and were arranged around the dais on which a pure platter held the green silk garland that, at the end of the morning, I would place upon the brow of the winner. 
As the interrogator, I stood front row center next to Mr. Woodbridge. Which language was spoken by the Sabines? Oskin, answered Fred Masudi without hesitation. Who composed the second triumvirate? Mark Anthony Octavian and Marcus Emilius Lepidus, sir, answered Deepak Mehta, who was routed at Philippa. Cedric Bell's eyes showed no recognition. He lowered his head in his hands as though pushing himself to the limit of his intellect, and in the front row my heart dropped. Several boys in the audience began to twitter. Cedric's leg began to shake inside his toga. When he looked up again, I felt that it was I who had put him in this unattainable position, I who had brought a tender bud too soon into the heat, and I wondered if he would ever forgive me. But then, without warning, he smiled slightly, folded his hands, and said, Brutus and Cassius. Good, I said instinctively. Then I gathered my poise. Who deposed Romulus Augustulus, the last emperor of the Western Empire? Odoacer, Fred Masudi answered, then added, in 476 AD. Who introduced the professional army to Rome? Gaius Marius, sir, answered Deepak Mehta, then himself added, in 104 BC. When I asked Cedric his next question, who was the leading Carthaginian general of the Second Punic War, I felt some unease because the boys in the audience seemed to sense that I was favoring him with an easier examination. Nonetheless, his head sank into his hands, and he appeared once again to be straining the limits of his memory before he looked up and produced the obvious answer, Hannibal. I was delighted. Not only was he proving my gamble worthwhile, but he was showing the twittering boys in the audience that under fire, discipline produces accurate thought. By now they had quieted, and I had the sudden, heartening premonition that Cedric Bell was going to surprise us after all, that his tortoise-like deliberation would win him, by morning's end, the garland of laurel. The next several rounds of questions proceeded much in the same manner as had the previous two. Deepak Mehta and Fred Masudi answered without hesitation, and Cedric Bell did so only after a tedious and deliberate period of thought. What I realized, in fact, was that his style made for excellent theater. The parents, I could see, were impressed, and Mr. Woodbridge next to me, no doubt, thinking about the next annual fun drive, was smiling broadly. After a second form boy had brought a glass of water to each of the contestants, I moved on to the next level of questions. These had been chosen for their difficulty, and on the first round, Fred Masudi fell out, not knowing the names of Augustus's children, he left the stage and moved back among his dim-witted pals in the audience. By the rule of clockwise progression, the same question then went to Deepak Mehta, who answered it correctly, followed by the next one, which concerned King Ugurtha of Numidia. Then, because I had no choice, I had to ask Cedric Bell something difficult. Which general had the support of the aristocrats in the Civil War of 88 BC? To the side, I could see several parents pursing their lips and furrowing their brows, but Cedric Bell appeared to not even notice the greater difficulty of the query. Again, he dropped his head into his hands. By now, the audience expected his period of deliberation, and they sat quietly. One could hear the hum of the ventilation system and the dripping of the icicles outside. Cedric Bell cast his eyes downward, and it was at this moment that I realized he was cheating. I had come to this job straight from my degree at Carleton College at the age of 21, having missed enlistment due to myopia, and carrying with me the hope that I could give to my boys the more important vision that my classical studies had given to me. I knew that they responded best to challenge. I knew that a teacher who coddled them at that age would only hold them back, would keep them in the bosoms of their mothers so long that they would remain weak-minded through preparatory school and inevitably then through college. The best of my own teachers had been tyrants. I well remembered this, yet at that moment I felt an inexplicable pity for the boy. Was it simply the humiliation we had both suffered at the hands of his father? I peered through my glasses at the stage and knew at once that he had attached the outline of ancient Roman history to the inside of his toga. I don't know how long I stood there between the school assembled behind me and the two boys seated in front, but after a period of internal deliberation during which time I could hear the rising murmurs of the audience, 
I decided that, in the long run, it was best for Cedric Bell to be caught. Oh, how the battle is lost for want of a horse. I leaned to Mr. Woodbridge next to me and whispered, I believe Cedric Bell is cheating. Ignore it, he whispered back. What? Of course, I have great respect for what Mr. Woodbridge did for St. Benedict's in the years he was among us. A headmaster's world is a far more complex one than a teacher, and it is historically inopportune to blame a life gone afoul on a single incident in childhood. However, I myself would have stood up for our principles had Mr. Woodbridge not at that point said, Ignore it, Hundert, or look for another job. Naturally, my headmaster's words startled me for a moment, but being familiar with the necessities of a boys' school and having recently entertained my first thoughts about one day becoming a headmaster myself, I simply nodded when Cedric Bell produced the correct answer, Lucius Cornelius Sola. Then I went on to the next question, which concerned Scipio Africanus Major. Deepak Mehta answered it correctly, and I turned once again to Cedric Bell. In a position of moral leadership, of course, compromise begets only more compromise. And although I know this now from my own experience, at the time I did so only from my study of history. Perhaps that is why I again found an unattainable compassion muddying my thoughts. What kind of desperation would lead a boy to cheat on a public stage? His father and his mother were well back in the crowded theater, but when I glanced behind me, my eye went instantly to them, as though they were indeed my own parents out from Kansas City. Who were the first emperors to reign over the divided empire? I asked Cedric Bell. When one knows the magician's tricks, the only wonder is in its obviousness, and as Cedric Bell lowered his head this time, I clearly saw the nervous flutter of his gaze directed into the toga. Indeed, I imagine him scanning the entire outline from Augustus to Giovanni, pasted inside the twill, before coming to an answer, which, pretending to ponder, he then spoke aloud, Valentinian the first and Valens. Suddenly, Cedric Bell called out, That's my boy! The crowd thundered, and I had the sudden, indefensible urge to steer the contest in young Cedric Bell's direction. In a few moments, however, from within the subsiding din, I heard the thin, accented voice of a woman speaking Deepak Mehta's name, and it was the presence of his mother, I suppose, that finally brought me to my senses. Deepak answered the next question about Diocletian correctly, and then I turned to Cedric Bell and asked him, Who was Hamilcar Barca? Of course, it was only Deepak who knew that this answer was not in the outline, because Hamilcar Barca was a Phoenician general eventually routed by the Romans. It was only Deepak, as I had noted, who had bothered to study the conquered peoples. He briefly widened his eyes at me in recognition, in gratitude, in disapproval, while beside him Cedric Bell again lowered his head into his hands. After a long pause, Cedric asked me to repeat the question. I did so, and after another long pause, He scratched his head. Finally, he said, "Geez." The boys in the audience laughed, but I turned and silenced them. Then I put the same question to Deepak Mehta, who answered it correctly, of course, and then received a round of applause that was polite, but not sustained. It was only as I mounted the stage to present Deepak with the garland of laurel, however, that I glanced at Mr. Woodbridge and realized that he, too, had wanted me to steer the contest towards Cedric Bell. At the same moment, I saw Senator Bell making his way toward the rear door of the hall. Young Sedgwick stood limply to the side of me, and I believe I had my first inkling then of the mighty forces that would twist the life of that boy. I could only imagine his thoughts as he stood there on stage while his mother, struggling to catch up with the senator, vanished through the fire door at the back. By the next morning, our calligraphers would add Deepak Mehta's name to the plaque outside Mr. Woodbridge's office, and young Cedric Bell would begin his lifelong pursuit of missed glory. Yet perhaps because of the disappointment I could see in Mr. Woodbridge's eyes, it somehow seemed that I was the one who had failed the boy, and as soon as the auditorium was empty, I left for his room. There I found him seated on the bed still in his toga, gazing out the small window to the lacrosse fields. I could see the sheets of my outline pressed against the inside of his garment. Well, young man, I said, knocking on the doorframe, 
That certainly was an interesting performance. He turned around from the window and looked at me coldly. What he did next, I have thought about many times over the years, the labyrinthine wiliness of it, and I can only attribute the precociousness of his maneuvering to the bitter education he must have received at home. As I stood before him in the doorway, Cedric Bell reached inside his cloak and one at a time lifted out the pages of my outline. I stepped inside and closed the door. Every teacher knows a score of boys who did their best to be expelled. This is a cliche in a school like ours, but as soon as I closed the door to his room and he acknowledged the act with a feline smile, I knew that this was not Cedric Bell's intention at all. I knew you saw, he said. Yes, you are correct. How come you didn't say anything, eh, Mr. Hundred? It's a complicated matter, Cedric. It's because my pop was there. It has nothing to do with your father. Sure, Mr. Hundred. Frankly, I was at my wit's end. First from what Mr. Woodbridge had said to me in the theater, and now from the audacity of the boy's accusation. I myself went to the window then and let my eyes wander over the campus so that they would not have to engage the dark, accusatory gaze of Cedric Bell. What transpires in an act of omission like the one I had committed? I do not blame Mr. Woodbridge, of course, any more than a soldier can blame his captain. What had happened was that instead of enforcing my own code of morals, I had allowed Cedric Bell to sweep me similarly into his. I did not know at the time what an act of corruption I had committed, although what is especially chilling to me is that I believe that Cedric Bell, even at the age of 13, did. He also knew, of course, that I would not pursue the matter. Although I spent the ensuing several days contemplating a disciplinary action, each time I summoned my resolve to submit the boy's name to the honor committee, my conviction waned. For at these times, I seemed to myself to be nothing more than one criminal turning in another. I fought this battle constantly, in my simple rooms, at the long chip table I governed in the dining hall, and at the dusty chalkboard before my classes, I felt like an exhausted swimmer trying to climb a slippery wall out of the sea. Furthermore, I was alone in my predicament, for among a boarding school faculty which is as perilous as a medieval court, one does not publicly discuss a boy's misdeeds. This is true even if the boy is not the son of a senator. In fact, the only teacher I decided to trust with my situation was Charles Ellerby, our new Latin instructor and a kindred lover of antiquity. I liked Charles Ellerby as soon as we had met because he was a moralist of no uncertain terms, and indeed, when I confided in him about Cedric Bell's behavior and Mr. Woodbridge's response, he suggested that it was my duty to circumvent our headmaster and speak directly to the boy's father. Of course, this made sense to me, even though I knew it would be difficult to do. I decided to speak to Senator Bell again. Less than a week after I had begun to marshal my resolve, however, the senator himself called me. He proffered a few moments of small talk, asked about the gun he had given me, and then said gruffly, Young man, my son tells me that the Hannibal Barca question was not on the list he had to know. Now, indeed, I was shocked. Even from young Cedric Bell, I had not expected this audacity. How deeply the viper is a viper, I said before I could help myself. Excuse me? The Phoenician general was Hamilcar Barca, sir, not Hannibal. The senator paused. My son tells me you asked him a question that was not on the list, which the Oriental fellow knew the answer to in advance. He feels you've been unfair is all. It's a complex situation, sir, I said. I marshaled my will again by imagining what Charles Ellerby would do in the situation. However, no sooner had I resolved to confront the senator than it became perfectly clear to me that I lacked the character to do so. I believe this had long been clear to Cedric Bell. I'm sure it's complex, Senator Bell said, but I assure you there are situations more complex. Now, I'm not asking you to correct anything this time, you understand. My son has told me a great deal about you, Mr. Hundred. If I were you, I'd remember that. Yes, sir. I said, although by then I realized he had hung up. And thus, young Cedric Bell and I began an uneasy compact that lasted out his days at St. Benedict's. He was a dismal student from that day forward, scratching at the very bottom of a class that itself 
was a far cry from the glorious yesteryear classes of John Dulles and Henry Stimson. His quizzes were abominations and his essays were pathetic digestions of those of the boys sitting next to him. He chatted amiably in study hall, smoked cigarettes in the third form linen room, and when called upon in class could be counted on to blink and stutter as if called upon from sleep. But perhaps the glory days of St. Benedict's had already begun their wane, for even then, well before the large problems that beset us, no action was taken against the boy. For Charles Ellerby and me, he became a symbol, the evidence of the first tendrils of moral rot that seemed to be twining among the posts and timbers of our school. Although we told nobody else of his secret, the boy's dim-witted recalcitrance soon succeeded in alienating all but the other students. His second and third form years passed as ingloriously as his first, and by the outset of his last with us, he had grown to mythic infamy among the faculty members who had known the school in its glory days. He had grown physically larger as well, and now, when I chanced upon him on campus, he held his ground against my disapproving stare with a dark one of his own. To complicate matters, he cultivated, despite his boorish character, an impressive popularity among his schoolmates, and it was only through the subtle intervention of several of his teachers that he had failed on two occasions to win the presidency of the student body. His stride had become a strut. His favor among the other boys, of course, had its origin in the strength of his physical features, in the precocious evil of his manner, and in the bellowing timber of his voice. But unfortunately, such crudities are all the more impressive to a group of boys living out of sight of their parents. That is not to say that the faculty of St. Benedict's had given up hope for Cedric Bell. Indeed, a teacher's career is punctuated with difficult students like him, and despite the odds, one could not help but root for his eventual rehabilitation, as did all the other teachers. I held out hope for Cedric Bell. In his fits of depravity and intellectual feebleness, I continued to look for glimpses of discipline and progress. By his fourth form year, however, when I had become dean of seniors, it was clear that Cedric Bell would not change, at least not while he was at St. Benedict's. Despite his powerful station, he had not even managed to gain admission to the state university. It was with a sense of failure then, finally, that I handed him his diploma in the spring of 1949, on an erected stage at the north end of the great field on which he came forward, met to my disapproving gaze with his own flat one, and trundled off to sit among his friends. It came as a surprise then when I learned in Richmond Gazette 37 years later of Cedric Bell's ascension to the chairmanship of East America Steel, at that time the second largest corporation in America. I chanced upon the news one morning in the winter of 1987, the year of my great problem with St. Benedict's, while reading the newspaper in the east light at breakfast room of the assistant headmaster's office. St. Benedict's, as everyone knows, had fallen upon difficult times by then, and an unseemly aspect of my job was that I had to maintain a lookout for possible donors to the school. Forthwith, I sent a letter to Cedric Bell. Apart from the five or six years in which a classmate had written to the Benedictine of his whereabouts, I had heard almost nothing about the boy since the year of his graduation. This was unusual, of course, as St. Benedict's makes a point of keeping abreast of its graduates, and I can only assume that his absence in the yearly alumni notes was due to an act of will on his own part. One wonders how much of the boy remained in the man. It is indeed a rare vantage that a St. Benedict's teacher holds to have known our statesmen, our policy makers, and our captains of industry in their days of short pants and classroom pranks. And I admit that it was with some nostalgia that I composed this letter. Since his graduation, of course, my career had proceeded with the steady ascension that the great schools have always afforded their dedicated teachers. Ten years after Cedric Bell's departure, I had moved from Dean of Seniors to dean of the upper school, and after a decade there, to dean of academics, a post that some would consider a demotion, but that I seized with reverence, because it afforded me the chance to make inroads on the minds of a generation. At the time, of course, the country was in the thoroughs of a violent peristalsic rejection of tradition, and I felt a particular urgency to my mission of staying a course that had led a century of boys through the rise and fall of ancient civilizations. In those days, our meetings of the faculty and trustees were rancorous affairs in which great pressure was exerted in attempts to alter the time-tested curriculum of the school. 
Planning a course was like going into battle, and hiring a new teacher was like crowning a king. Whenever one of our ranks retired or left for another school, the different factions fought tooth and nail to influence the appointment. I was the dean of academics, as I have noted, and these skirmishes naturally were waged around my foxhole. For the lesser appointments, I often fainted to gather leverage for the greater ones, whose campaigns I fought with abandon. At one point especially, midway through that decade in which our country had lost its way, St. Benedict's arrived at a crossroads. The chair of humanities had retired and a pitched battle over his replacement developed between Charles Ellerby and a candidate from outside. A meeting ensued in which my friend and this other man spoke to the assembled faculty and trustees, and though I will not go into detail, I will say that the outside candidate felt that because of the advances in our society, History had become little more than a relic. Oh, what dim-sided times those were. The two camps sat on opposite sides of the chapel as speakers took the podium one after another to wage war. The controversy quickly became a forum concerning the relevance of the past. Teacher after teacher debated the import of what we in history had taught for generations, and assertion after assertion was met with boos and applause. Tempers blazed. One powerful member of the board had come to the meeting in blue jeans and a tie-dyed shirt, and after we had been arguing for several hours and all of us were exhausted, he took the podium and challenged me personally right then and there to debate with him the merits of Roman history. He was not an ineloquent man, and he chose to speak his plea first, so that by the time he had finished his attack against antiquity, I sensed that my battle on behalf of Charles Ellerby and of history itself was near to lost. My heart was gravely burdened, for if we could not win our point here among teachers, then among whom indeed could we win it? The room was silent, and on the other side of the chapel, our appointments were gathering nearer to one another in the pews. When I rose to defend my calling, however, I also sensed that victory was not beyond my reach. I am not a particularly eloquent orator, but as I took my place at the chancel rail in the amber glow of the small rose window above us, I was braced by the sudden conviction that the great men of history had sent me forward to preserve their deeds. Charles Ellerby looked up at me, biting his lip, and suddenly I remembered the answer I had written long ago in the crier. Its words flowed as though unbidden from my tongue, and when I had finished, I knew that we had won. It was my proudest moment at St. Benedict's. Although the resultant split among the faculty was an egregious one, Charles Ellerby secured the appointment, and together we were able to do what I had always dreamed of doing. We redoubled our commitment to classical education. In times of upheaval, of course, adherence to tradition is all the more important, and perhaps this is why St. Benedict's was brought intact through that decade and the one that followed. Our fortunes lifted and dipped with the gentle rhythm to which I had long ago grown accustomed. Our boys won sporting events and prizes, endured minor scandals and occasional tragedies, and then passed on to good colleges. Our endowment rose when the government was in the hands of Republicans, as did the caliber of our boys when it was in the hands of Democrats. Senator Bell declined from prominence, and within a few years, I read that he had passed away. In time, I was made assistant headmaster. Indeed, it was not until a few years ago that anything out of the ordinary happened at all. For it was then, in the late 1980s, that some ill-advised investments were made and our endowment suffered a decline. Mr. Woodbridge had by this time reached the age of 74, and although he was a vigorous man, one Sunday morning in May, while the school waited for him in chapel, he died open-eyed in his bed. Immediately there occurred a Byzantine struggle for succession, there was nothing wrong with admitting that by then I myself coveted the job of headmaster, for one does not remain five decades at a school without becoming deeply attached to its fate. But Mr. Woodbridge's death had come suddenly and I had not yet begun the preparations for my bid. I was, of course, no longer a young man. I suppose, in fact, that I lost my advantage here by underestimating my opponents, who indeed was younger, as Caesar had done with Brutus and Cassius. I should not have been surprised then when, after several days of maneuvering, my principal rival turned out to be Charles Ellerby. For several years, I discovered he had been conducting his own internecine campaign for the position, 
and although I had always counted him as my ally and my friend, in the first meeting of the board, he rose and spoke accusations against me. He said that I was too old, that I had failed to change with the times, that my method of pedagogy might have been relevant 40 years ago, but that it was not relevant today. He stood and said that a headmaster needed vigor and that I did not have it. Although I watched him the entire time he spoke, he did not once look back at me. I was wounded, of course, both professionally and in the hidden part of my heart in which I had always counted Charles Ellerby as a companion in my lifelong search for the magnificence of the past. When several of the older teachers booed him, I felt cheered. At this point, I saw that I was not alone in my bid, merely behind, and so I left the meeting without coming to my own defense. Evening had come, and I walked to the dining commons in the company of allies. How it is, when fighting for one's life, to eat among children. As the boys in their school blazers passed around the platters of fish sticks and the bowls of sliced bread, my heart was pierced with their guileless grace. How soon, I wondered, would they see the truth of the world? How long before they would understand that it was not dates and names that I had always meant to teach them? Not one of them seemed to notice what had ascended like thunderheads above their faculty. Not one of them seemed unable to eat. After dinner, I returned to the assistant headmaster's house in order to plot my course and confer with those I still considered allies. But before I could begin my preparations, there was a knock at the door. Charles Ellerby stood there, red in the cheeks. May, may I ask you some questions? He said breathlessly. It is I who ought to ask them of you, was my answer. He came in without being asked and took a seat at my table. You've never been married, am I correct, Hundred? Look, Ellerby, I've been at St. Benedict since you were in prep school yourself. Yes, yes, he said in an exaggeration of boredom. Of course he knew as well as I that I had never been married nor started a family because history itself had always been enough for me. He rubbed his head and appeared to be thinking. To this day, I wonder how he knew about what he said next, unless Sedgwick Bell had somehow told him the story of my visit to the senator. Look, he said, there's a room where you keep a pistol in your desk drawer. Hogwash. Will you open it for me? He said, pointing there. No, I will not. I have been a dean here for twenty years. Are you telling me there is no pistol in this house? He then attempted to stare me down. We had known each other for the good part of both of our lives, however, and the bid withered. At that point, in fact, as his eyes fell in submission to my determined gaze, I believe the headmastership became mine. It is a largely unexplored element of history, of course, and one that has long fascinated me, that a great deal of political power, and thus a great deal of the arc of nations, arises not from intellectual advancements nor social imperatives, but from the simple battle of wills among men at tables, such as had just occurred between Charles Ellerby and me. Instead of opening the desk and brandishing the weapon, however, which of course meant nothing to me but no doubt would have seized the initiative from Ellerby, I denied to him its existence. Why, I do not know, for I was a teacher of history and was not the firearm its greatest engine. Ellerby, on the other hand, was simply a gadfly to the passing morals of the time. He gathered his things and left my house. That evening, I took the pistol from my drawer. A margin of rust had appeared along the filigreed handle, and despite the ornate workmanship, I saw clearly now that, in its essence, the weapon was ill-proportioned and blunt, the crude instrument of a violent, historically meager man. I had not even wanted it when the irascible demagogue Bell had foisted it upon me, and I had only taken it out of some vague sentiment that a pistol might eventually prove decisive. I suppose I had always imagined firing it some day in a moment of drama, yet now here it stood before me in a moment of torpor. I turned it over and cursed it. That night I took it from the drawer again, hid it in the pocket of my overcoat, and walked to the far end of the campus where I crossed the marsh a good mile from my house, removed my shoes and stepped into the babbling shallows of the Passamic. The die is cast, I said, and I threw it twenty yards out into the water. The last impediment to my headmastership had been hurdled, and by the time I came ashore, walked back, whistling to my front door, and changed for bed, I was ecstatic. Yet that night I slept poorly, 
and in the morning when I rose and went to our faculty meeting, I felt that the mantle of my fortitude had slipped somehow from my shoulders. How hushed is demise. In the hall outside the faculty room, most of the teachers filed by without speaking to me, and once inside, I became obsessed with the idea that I had missed this most basic lesson of the past, that conviction is the alpha and the omega of authority. Now I see that I was doomed the moment I threw the pistol in the water, for that is when I lost my conviction. It was as though Cedric Bell had risen all these years later to drag me down again. Indeed, once the meeting had began, the older faculty members shrunk back from their previous support of my bid, and the younger ones encircled me as though I were a limping animal. There might as well have been a dagger among the cloaks. By four o'clock that afternoon, Charles Ellerby, a fellow antiquarian whose job I had once helped secure, had been named headmaster. And by the end of that month, he had asked me to retire. And so I was preparing to end my days at St. Benedict's when I received Cedric Bell's response to my letter. It was well written, which I noted with pleasure, and contained no trace of rancor, which is what every teacher hopes to see in the maturation of his disagreeable students. In closing, he asked me to call him at East American Steel, and I did so that afternoon. When I gave my name first to one secretary and then to a second, and after that, moments later, heard Sedgwick's artfully guileless greeting, I instantly recalled speaking to his father some forty years before. After small talk, including my condolences about his father, he told me that the reason he had replied to my letter was that he had often dreamed of holding a rematch of Mr. Julius Caesar and that he was now willing to donate a large sum of money to St. Benedict's if I would agree to administer the event. Naturally, I assumed he was joking and passed off the idea with a comment about how funny it was, but Cedric Bell repeated the invitation. He wanted very much to be on stage again with Deepak Mehta and Fred Masudi. I suppose I should not have been surprised, for it is precisely the sort of childhood slight that will drive a great figure. I told him that I was about to retire, he expressed sympathy, but then suggested that the arrangement could be ideal, as now I would no doubt have time to prepare. Then he said that, at this station in his life, he could afford whatever he wanted materially, and with all this implied, of course, concerning his donation to the annual fund, but that more than anything else, he desired the chance to reclaim his intellectual honor. I suppose I was flattered. Of course, he also offered a good sum of money to me personally, Although I had until then led a life in which finances were never more than a distant concern, I was keenly aware that my time in the school's houses and dining halls was coming to an end. On the other hand, it was not my burning aspiration to secure an endowment for the reign of Charles Ellerby. On the other hand, I needed the money, and I felt a deep loyalty to the school regarding the annual fund. That evening, I began to prepare my test.